UFC 284 just wrapped up and Australia delivered with a pretty banger main card. I'm going to talk about all of the matchups on it. Make sure you guys smash the likes if you're new to the channel. Subscribe and turn those post notifications on too. First fight of the night. It started off with, in my opinion, a very controversial decision. Elves Brenner wins against Zabira Tuhugov, but I completely disagree with those scorecards. I thought that Tuhugov had it. You can give Brenner moments in the fight, but if you really look, he wasn't landing effective strikes. He was just doing a lot of movement and throwing a lot of strikes. Tuhugov's jab, very underappreciated in the fight, it seems. I thought that he had done enough to win. Granted, I was not overly impressed by him either. Natural 45er. He misses weight at 55. I do think because he was the first fight of the night, he's like, I ain't cutting this extra pound and a half with a limited rehydration time, which is something that maybe, you know, had some of a, a factor in uh, his lackluster performance, which I still think that he won, though. I feel like he did enough, but just I didn't feel like Brenner was a guy that should have even been going long with him. At the weigh-ins, I didn't love what I saw from Tuhugov. Obviously, he missed weight. Brenner, big dude, real 55er, gets himself a controversial decision win against Tuhugov. Good way to start his career on a win, but I feel is that it was a clean loss. So Tuhugov should have won, unfortunately, loses to start the night off. And uh, yeah, that was a sour taste starting things very early. Second fight of the night, Blake Builder, Shane Young. Clean win. Blake Builder's a G. First round, I thought it was Builder. Second round, Young was having moments, and then Builder's able to finish strong. I really don't think he's going to be a guy that's washed out of the UFC quick. He's not a, not a two-loss-and-done type fighter. 8-0 at 32. I see explosiveness. I see some power and definitely some grappling skills. Beat Shane Young by a decision, a fight where he was still tested a bit. How high is his ceiling? I don't know necessarily, but I do think he's got some fights left. I think he'll be around for a bit at 32. He's in a very dangerous featherweight division. Does have a good frame for it. And he has a fun style. He's a guy that I like. And I do think he's got a you know, decent enough future. I don't know about rankings. We'll see. He's already 32. But hey, I expect the gas on the pedal and consistent fights for Shane Young. We might be seeing him get his walking papers. Next fight on the card, Loma Lupume versus Elise Reed. Listen, Lupume wanted to grapple in this fight and showcase her submission skills. In the first round, it almost cost her with Reed getting dominant position, using a sweep to end up on top, getting some ground and pound off. Loma Lupume, though, in the second round is like, fuck this shit. You're not going to take me down and take my back and control me. I'm going to beat you up. She goes, picks up Elise Reed, slams her, takes the back, rear naked choke like that. 44 seconds in, manhandled. I guess woman handled Elise Reed would be the proper way to say it. I think Lupume has a really bright future in the sport. She's 27. She's 8-3. and three. She's beating the people she's supposed to. I'm a fan of Luke Bume, good Muay Thai, as well as a strong grappling game, I think. Maybe not the top tier strength, but right now at just 27 and more so coming from the Thai background, Luke Bume's developing well. She's good. I like her potential, and she's uh, representing Muay Thai and Thailand in these women divisions pretty damn well. So I like Luke Bume. Good win for Elise Reed, outmatched as I expected here. Next fight on the card, Jack Jenkins and Don Shannis. Listen, Jack Jenkins was in for a dogfight because Don Shannis wasn't there to lose. But every moment that Shannis would have, Jenkins followed up with way more. He did have the grappling edge, but really the punch combinations were so on point. He said, I'm not a one-trick pony. I loved it after he had his moment. Jack Jenkins is a pretty good prospect, 29 years of age. Beat a game, Don Shannis. I'll tell you this, though. We're not cutting Don Shannis from the UFC. I think he deserves to stick around because he's a game fighter that can go a bit long and make it competitive at moments with Jack Jenkins. Yes, he was at a disadvantage in the boxing. He was at a disadvantage in the wrestling, but he still showed a ton of grit and had some all right moments in the fight. Jack Jenkins, though, well-deserved win, and he's got a bright future moving forward. 29, still young enough to do something. It's 145, stacked weight class, but... I like Jack Jenkins. I don't hate, you know, a Jack Jenkins versus Blake Builder fight somewhere down the line. I could see those two crossing paths being in the same weight class, see similar statures, both one on this card. I don't know if that's the next fight, but down the line, I could see that matchup happening. Next fight on the card, Jamie Mularkey, clean win. Francisco Prado got shown a new level in the striking and the grappling by Jamie Mularkey, and that level is UFC. 
Prado was a big power striker, fought through the Argentine circuit, and he did have punching power. When he landed, you could see that he hit hard, but Jamie Malarkey was too crisp for him. You could tell the high-level fight experience, mixing in the grappling too. Prado had no answer, and it seemed like Prado was giving up on himself just a bit, and Jamie Malarkey's not a guy that's going to lose confidence out there. He looked on the money, landed good punches. The jab was keeping Prado at bay. Kicks were on point. Takedowns were on point. Clean win for Jamie Malarkey against a kid who's only 20. So the future is still bright for a Prado if he really digs down and sticks with it and improves upon some holes in the game. 20, I think, is a little young to be at UFC level, but other people have done it. Rosas right now doing his thing, and he's 18, so there's exceptions to the rule. It's very young to be in the UFC, though. Grinley was 11-0. Great record. Loses to Malarkey starting things out. We'll see what the future holds for him. This is not a devastating loss. But it's a real loss. It's, it's a tough defeat to take. But Malarkey, a tough matchup probably for your damn debut. Prado still had okay moments in the fight. Lower level competition. We'll see how he shines. I think he's young enough where he could take some time off and then come back with more skills. Because, I mean, a 20-year-old, in six months, he could get way better. Good win for Malarkey, though. Next fight. Clayton Rodriguez by easy work. Over Shannon Ross. This was not competitive at all. The body kicks were on point and then punch combos in close. Ross was wobbled. He tight covered up and he got stopped. Good good stoppage by the ref. Ross went down. Those body shots were hurting him too, even in close with the flurries. And he was done. He he kind of gave in, man. He lost on the contender series. Now he loses his UFC debut. That's two straight losses. And I mean, did, did they keep him around after a beatdown? 59 seconds? How good is Clayton? I don't know yet. The C.J. Vergara fight, I think underperformed a little bit. Because against Shannon Ross, he looked really, really solid. I guess being 33, you keep Ross probably around for one more. But he's 13-7, and seven, man. That's not a great record. Especially at flyweight, there's so many killers. Clayton Rodriguez, 27 years old. He's got a lot of time. Monsters in that weight class. Interesting matchups moving forward. Definitely not a ranked guy or anything like that. But the potential's there. It was a good stoppage. Like, I like the way that he started so fast. The kicks were on point. His creativity's there. Clayton Rodriguez has got some potential for sure, and his skill set is evident. Let's keep running. Next fight. This one here. Melsic Bagdasarian looked really fucking good early. Josh Kulabeo on the other side was getting out kickbox. Bagdasarian's range was on point. He was finding shots. He busted Kulabeo's nose up. And then comes... Perfect shot, jab, kind of gets Melsic off balance. He falls. Kula Bayo jumps right on him, gets the back, and the rear naked choke is in before the hooks. Bagdasarian forced the tap in a fight that he looked clearly ahead, comfortably ahead. He had the striking advantage here, but Kula Bayo was the mixed martial artist, and this is MMA, and he got it done, winning by submission against a kickboxer. Kula Bayo, normally a striker, showed some chops on the floor. Big win for him. Melsic Begdazari and him had some bad blood early on, especially, uh, you know, at the weigh-ins, the freaking choke by Melsic. He ends up getting choked himself. I guess it's a little bit of karma. A little bit of karma in this matchup here. Good win for Josh Kulabale on the submission, the comeback in Australia. You got to be happy for the guy. Um, and Melsic Begdazari, still really nasty kickboxing, but it's MMA, baby. And, uh, you know, he got strangled. Next fight on the card, it was the featured prelim. Modestus Bauskis put it on Tyson Pedro. It was not competitive. This was a one-sided performance where Tyson Pedro honestly showed me he cannot strike. He's got a bit of power against guys that are kind of mid as hell, but he's fighting a decent fighter in Modestus Bauskis. He gets out kickboxed the whole time. He's scared to enter range. He's getting touched up. The chin is high. He looks like a jiu-jitsu fighter trying to strike. That's how he looks. That's just what it is. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Couldn't get that position to get the finish over Bukowskis. He had some moments, but ultimately lost the fight. Bukowskis put it on him. He finished strong. You could tell who wanted it more, who was ready to dig deeper. Modestus is a pretty solid fighter. Taking this fight on a fucking week's notice, coming in and beating Tyson Pedro in Australia, that's a round of applause type performance he deserves the respect and credit he beat Pedro who was a big favorite someone I felt like the UFC was trying to build for that Aussie market but he just don't have it man I don't think he's got the striking and when it's time to dig deep as fuck I don't think he could find it and his takedowns aren't all that great really good jujitsu but not a great wrestler so 
Limited game for sure. Modesto Spalskis with a clean win. And he said, listen, I'm going to have a better run this time out. And I believe he will. He lost some fights in his first UFC run. This is his second, second stint inside of the octagon. He looks much improved. And he beat Tyson Pedro. I call it a good win. I like Modesto Spalskis moving forward. Fun guy to watch more in the back end, though, of light heavyweight. Let's jump to the main card. If you guys haven't, smashed the likes. And if you're new, subscribe. It's a draw to start it off. It's Jimmy Crute versus Alonzo Manyfield. I see how you scored a draw because Manyfield was landing bombs. Not enough to get a 10-8, but hurting Jimmy Crute in the fight in the first two rounds. Third round, Manyfield grabs the fence. Referee Mark Otter deducts a point immediately. Jimmy Crute has a dominant round. So it turns into a 10-8 third and then two 10-9s in the first and second. Good finish by Jimmy Crudy. Survived some hell. He was hurt badly. Wobbled on his feet. Was that an early point deduction is the question. I think the scorecard is right. I think it's a draw. It was a majority draw. One judge actually scored it for Jimmy Crude. I think draw makes a lot of sense. The thing is, does Menefield deserve to have a point deducted with a cage grab? I'm going to say yes for the simple fact that a cage grab can seriously impact the result of a fight. What if that fighter landed that takedown that the cage was used to stop and then he would have got a submission win or a ground and pound TKO. There's a serious, you know, alter of fights if you grab the cage. So I understand they're trying to get on these point deductions. He got warned, I believe, in the first round. I know he got warned once before for a light cage grab. This time, Garda said none of it. Boom, we're taking a point. I think their UFC, MMA, the commission in general, they really want to push that if you grab that cage, that's a significant foul. Accidental kick to the groins, they'll give you a few. Eye pokes even. Even an accidental headbutt. Not always. Not with Chris Tyone. But for the most part, you grab that cage, they're taking a point quick. They give you one warning and then point deduction. It cost many field. I think the win. 29-28 would have been fair his way. Draw makes a lot of sense. Interesting position. I think maybe you run it back. They both seem down for that. I'm down for it too. What else are we going to do? And then we look at the next fight. Justin Taffa, Parker Porter. Listen. He channeled a little inner Mark Hunt. The soul of Mark Hunt shined through the straight of Justin Taffa, who flatlined Parker Porter. He's a dangerous southpaw striker with real knockout power in his hands. If he can defend takedowns, especially these heavyweights that don't have crazy reaches, they're going to be in some trouble against bad man Justin Taffa. He flatlines Parker Porter. At one point, Parker Porter's on a three-fight UFC win streak against the back-end heavyweights. Yeah, absolutely. But Justin Taffa at one point lost to Jorgen Di Castro by knockout. Jared Vandera has a win over him. He lost to Carlos Felipe, a guy who's not even in the UFC anymore, too. Di Castro also not in the UFC. He's now got some rhythm. Harry Hunsucker, that win doesn't mean a ton because Hunsucker's never won a fight in the octagon. But Parker Porter is a legitimate back-end heavyweight. That's a tricky matchup. And Taffa flatlined him in one shot. Justin Taffa's dangerous, man. If he can stay off of his back, he can hurt some of these heavyweights, especially these slow, unranked heavyweights. If they're not great at exploding for takedowns, you're striking with Tafa, you're in trouble. I like Justin Tafa, man. Moving forward, I think big things are on the horizon. I don't know about big things meaning he's going to be the world champ, but I think big matchups and fun fights because he has an enjoyable style and he's very Mark Hunt-like and that just sells a ton. He brings the soul of Mark Hunt out of him as he fights, and I love to see it. Good win for Justin Taffa, and his brother Junior Taffa is a prospect that we got to keep an eye out. Uh, they believe that he's fighting at 205 too, so interested in that guy on the come up. Let's get to the featured bout. Jack Della Maddalena, Randy Brown. Listen, I picked Jack Della Maddalena as the lock of the week, and he was more than that. He looked incredible. He ends up getting a submission. He drops Randy Brown. Could have got a ground and pound TKO, but rear naked chokes him and shows, yes, I got submissions in my arsenal too. Jack Della Maddalena right now, I think, beats Jorge Masvidal. His boxing is crazy good. He's kind of like a Robert Whitaker of 170. I'll give him that comparison, but I think that his stand-up is more smooth. He's a money southpaw, great boxing combos, big power in his hands, and it doesn't look like he loads up on his shots. It's just perfect precision, and he wobbles you. He hit Randy Brown with that right hook, and Randy Brown's whole body just gave out. Jack Della Madeline is a problem. I really see him as a future contender, striking-wise. Definitely one of the best in the weight class already. Bright future for sure. A lot of fun matchups on the horizon at 170 for him. But like skill set-wise... This is someone from Australia they can build 
into a star. I see him as a future title challenger. I'm going to give him the comparison on the feet, like better than the likes of a Dustin Poirier, for sure. I know he's a lower weight class, but comparing him different than a Conor McGregor. But you got to agree that he has a unique flow that's pleasurable to watch as such of like a Conor McGregor, a real top level striker in MMA or a wonder boy, different style. Absolutely. I'm not saying he fights like them. But that pleasing aesthetic of, wow, this fucking guy's good. And I see very bright future for Jack Della Maddalena. 26. He's a baby in this game. And he just beat Randy Brown, who's been in there with some heavy hitters. Went the distance and beat Chaos Williams, who's known as a dynamite puncher. Jack Della Maddalena's no joke, guys. He's going to run some people over. And he's got the look for it with that smashed nose. I love it. Huge win for him. Bright future. Excellent performance. 10 out of 10. Couldn't have got better. Co-main event. Yeah, your Rodriguez put it on Josh Emmett. Listen, there was, you know, a moment where Josh Emmett really hurt Yair at the end of uh, that first round. But you look at the fight overall, the outside striking for Yair is crazy. His kicks are like fucking baseball bats being swung at you. Destroyed Emmett's body with his kicks. You could tell he was hurting him to the legs when he was going high. Emmett's blocking him. It looked like Emmett mentally broke at the end. Because Yair gets a triangle choke. He first shoots an armbar, then sets up triangle. It's like Josh Emmett almost just gave it to him. Went into the choke. I think mentally, he lost belief that he had a shot. Especially Yair off his back. The dude's got elbows from hell. He's a monster. Yair Rodriguez is coming to his own. He looks incredible. Clean win over Josh Emmett. Josh showed some power, hurt him early. But ultimately, throughout the whole fight, it was the Yair, the Yair show. Even on the bottom, Yair is winning the grappling ground and pound exchange. He's a dangerous fight for Volkanovski next. I really love that matchup. Damn, bro. Yair Rodriguez, is, he's found this flow. He beat up Josh Emmett dominantly. And his kicking is just crazy good. I see those kicks from the outside, and I'm just mesmerized how fast they come. He's a real good fighter. Yair Rodriguez has found this flow. He's the interim champion now, and he's going to be fighting Volkanovski at some point soon. And I think that's a tremendous matchup. Main event of the evening. Smash the likes, guys. If you're new, subscribe. Let's talk about it. Islam Makachev, Alexander Volkanovski. Islam gets the win, but I feel like Volkanovski... Won the many, the hearts of the many. The people feel like uh, he was the winner, the people's champ. I see a lot of people talking about great the performances and whatnot. And I agree. Alexander Volkanovsky finished the fight on top of Islam Makachev from the guard, throwing ground and pound strikes. Who does that to Islam? No one. Alexander Volkanovsky, the pound for pound now number two guy in the world. But I think Volkanovski gives Islam a, a run for their money every time they fight. He just got to get started a little bit earlier. I want to see them run it back. I want to do it again. I'm down as hell to see that rematch. I don't think it happens right away, but soon enough. You look at the first round, some success in the striking for Volkanovski. Makachev gets a little bit of success too. Second round, competitive. You see Makachev end up flash knockdowning uh, Volkanovski. Third round was a good one. It's like iffy how you score it, right? The fight's oddly competitive and it's all blending together for me at this point but I know the fourth round they lean it towards Makachev because of the back control but let's be honest Volkanovski is landing strikes from the back position I'm not saying this was a bad decision I think that you give it to Islam Makachev based on the unified scoring system but if you're looking at it from the people's eyes Makachev finished on his back getting beaten up with ground and pound and looked like he'd been in a real scrap even holding the back of Volkanovski in the fourth round, fourth round is more of a desperate hold. Would we find out? Islam Makachev's kickboxing is actually pretty world class. His grappling skills are A1 as expected, but Volk's grappling defense, crazy good, and he finishes the fight on top. So there's questions now. Does Islam Makachev have his boogeyman aesthetic anymore? Is he, oh my God, he's unbeatable? I don't think so. You look and he looks human. They have made Dagestan look human. Of course, the Australians will do it. I think that... It will build the confidence of other contenders, but I don't think they should get ahead of themselves too much. Alexander Volkanovsky is an all-time great. He's got some of the best skills ever, and his adaptability in fights, second to none. If he's fighting Islam in eight rounds, I think that he'll win that fight. If there's no time limit, or if there's no break in the action, if there's just round after round until we get a finish, I think there's a good chance Volkanovsky finishes strong because the gas tank is unbeatable. It's insane. Islam Makachev showed good kickboxing for sure. And he's got, you know, tremendous skills. And I think, is he pound for pound number one? I still want to keep Volk at number one, but it has to be Makachev because he beat him, right? Interesting picture in that division because Benil's fighting Charles. 
Dustin Poirier is free. Fiziev's fighting Gaethje. How long does Makachev want off? He says he wants to come back quick. Volkanovski now has to obviously deal with Yair. How long do we wait? Like, let's say the universe lines it up. Let's say that Makachev wins his next fight. Volk wins his next fight. Do we jump into that matchup as a rematch right away? Or does Volk have to defend a couple more times before we bring him back to Islam Makachev? So, so much possibilities with this weight class. Either way, Alexander Volkanovsky, to me, he asserts himself in the all-time great category. Going in there and giving Islam Makachev, who looks like a future great too, hell and rising questions upon how a rematch would go and people even complain enough to say they think Volk won. I don't think he did. I think the score was fair towards Islam Makachev. Three rounds to two rounds. It was real close. The striking moments were still there for Makachev. He dropped Volkanovski. I know that Makachev got dropped a bit too, but then he'd finish and scramble in dominant positions on the ground. One judge, I think one or two judges had it 49-46 which uh, a little why they're saying only the fifth round tricky for me i think maybe you go what is it one two four makachev five three volkanovsky that's kind of what i'm feeling but it was a super competitive fight even in the rounds that someone was winning there was great moments for both guys it was an excellent display in australia i think volk's got everything to be proud of obviously aside from having two straps on his shoulder but he gave dagestan hell and he showed team dagestan you're human, man. And I think this is going to build confidence of all fighters around the world fighting these Dagestanis that they're not unbeatable. I think they beat you mentally before they get you in the cage and then you think you're going to get ragdolled. Volk said no, and he did pretty damn well against the best of them all. So, great fight. Makachev for the win. I want to review the picks real quick. Obviously, we won with the main event, so that's 1-0. and We lose with the co-main. We're 1-1. One and one. We win with Jack Della, so this is now 2-1. and one. We win with Tafa, 4-1. and one. So, we finish the main card 4-1-1. One, and one. I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty stoked. Is it four one and one or is it three one and one? Excuse me. One, two, excuse me, three one and one to finish out the main card. And then we go what? Three two and one, three three and one, four three and one, four four and one, five, four five and one. I'm fucking losing count over here, guys. I'm redoing it. Hold on real quick, man. This is this is after a long day of streaming. I gotta recount this. So we won this one. One and one, two and one, three and one, three one and one, four and two, th three and two, three and three, four and three, four and four, five and four, six and four, seven and four, seven, five. One as the official record, but it really should have been eight, four, and one if not for this controversial decision. Yeah, that first one I had a, a full brain fart as I'm counting it. But hey, the lock of the week came through. I'm happy about that. One of the dogs, Blake Builder, gets to win. Jack Della being the lock, Blake Builder being uh, one of the valuable underdogs this week. So pretty solid picks. Not as good as I would have liked to be, but we come back with a vengeance for UFC Vegas 69. And at the end of the day, as a fight fan, I know you guys were entertained as hell. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Big things coming. I'll be uh, dropping my full card predictions on the channel tomorrow, or I guess today actually now. And then I'll also be uh, doing the every fight to make next. So we're not done talking about UFC 284 just yet. I love the fight. Dagestan is human. That's a big takeaway for me. Co-main event, yeah, years legs, might as well be fucking arms, third and fourth, so he's a freak. And Jack Della Maddalena, I see as a guy challenging for a world title. His striking is fucking phenomenal. So UFC 284, I give it a big thumbs up. I think you can give it like a 8.5 out of 10. The prelims weren't A1, but the main card was really, really fucking good. So I'm happy as hell with it. Thank you all for watching. Smash the likes. Definitely let me know what you uh, thought of UFC 284 in the comments. Drop a W in the chat to boost the algorithm for your boy. And I will see you all in the next one. Peace, guys.